Chapter thirteen of part two of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand, part two. Chapter thirteen. Paris, December eighteen twenty one. What I did in the midst of this confusion my solitary days mademoiselle monet i arranged a plan of my journey to america with the help of m de malesherbes bonaparte and myself obscure sub-lieutenants the marquis de la rouerie i embark at st malo last sorts on quitting my native land the year seventeen ninety completed the measures sketched out in the year seventeen eighty nine the possessions of the church at first put into the hands of the nation were confiscated the civil constitution of the clergy decreed the nobility abolished i was not present at the federation of july seventeen ninety a rather serious indisposition confined me to bed but i had been much entertained previously by the wheelbarrow scene in the champ de mars madame de steel has described it with extraordinary cleverness i shall always regret not having seen m talleyrand repeat the mass assisted by the abbe louis as i also regret not having seen him with the sabre at his side giving audience to the ambassador from the grand turk Mirabeau lost his popularity in 1790, his connections with the court were evident. M. Necker resigned his post of minister, and retired. No one had any desire to detain him. Mesdames, the king's aunts, left for Rome, furnished with a passport from the National Assembly. The Duke of Orléans, after his return from England, declared himself the humble and obedient servant of the king. The societies of friends to the constitution, which had multiplied in different parts of France, leagued themselves with the original society in Paris received its ideas and executed its orders public life met a favourable disposition in my character what passed in common attracted me because in a crowd i retained my solitude of soul and had not to struggle with my timidity the saloons too participating in the general movement became a little less repugnant to my mind and i had in spite of myself made some new acquaintances among these was the marquise de villette her husband whose reputation was much calumniated wrote in the journal de paris in conjunction with monsieur the king's brother madame de villette herself still a very charming woman lost a daughter of about sixteen who was yet more charming and in memory of whom the chevalier de parny wrote this stanza worthy of their ontology au ciel elle a rendu sa vie et doucement s'est endormie son murmurer contre ses lois ainsi le sourire s'efface ainsi meurt son laissé de trace le chant d'un oiseau dans les bois my regiment quartered at Rouen, preserved its discipline for some time it was engaged in a conflict with the people at the execution of the comedian mordier who suffered under the last exercise of the parliamentary power hung one day he would have been a hero the next had he lived four-and-twenty hours longer but at length insurrection broke out among the soldiers in Navarre. the marquis de mortemar emigrated the officers followed him i had neither adopted nor rejected the new opinions as little disposed to attack as to advocate them I neither wished to emigrate nor to continue my military career. I therefore retired. Being free from all ties in opinion, I had on the one hand rather warm disputes with my brother and President de Rosambo, on the other discussions not less bitter with Ganguené, La Harpe, and Chamfort. From the days of my earliest youth, my political impartiality had pleased no one. I only attached importance to the questions then mooted in as far as they bore upon general ideas of human liberty and dignity by this standard i judged them personal politics wearied me my true life was in higher regions the streets of paris crowded as they now were by day and by night no longer permitted the indulgence of my whims i sought solitude in the theatre establishing myself in the depths of a box i allowed my thoughts to wander to the verses of racine the music of sacchini or the dances at the opera i must have intrepidly sat out la barbe bleu and le sabot perdu twenty times running at the theatre on the italian boulevard wearing myself in order to get rid of ennui like an owl in a hole in a wall while the monarchy was crumbling to the ground i heard neither the crash of the secular arches nor the drawling of the vaudeville neither the voice of mirabeau thundering from the tribune nor that of colin singing to babette on the stage qu'il pleuve qu'il vente ou qu'il neige quand la nuit est longue en la brèche m monet director of the mines and his young daughter was sometimes sent by madame ganguené to disturb me in my hermit-like solitude mademoiselle monet sat down at the front of the box and i behind her half grumbling half pleased 
i know not whether she pleased me whether i liked her but i was afraid of her when she was gone i regretted her although rejoicing that she was no longer beside me nevertheless i sometimes gave myself great trouble to go and call for her and walk with her i gave her my arm and even occasionally i think pressed the one which rested on mine one idea now occupied my mind almost entirely that of going to the united states i wanted a useful aim for this journey I therefore proposed to myself, as I have mentioned in these memoirs and in several of my works, to discover the Northwest Passage. This project was by no means uncongenial to, or independent of, my poetic nature. No one cared for me, I was then, like Bonaparte, an insignificant sub-lieutenant, utterly without name in the world. We both rose from obscurity at the same period, I to seek my renown in solitude, he his fame among men. Not having given my heart to any woman, my sylph still haunted my imagination. I looked forward to the felicity of realising with her my fantastic wanderings in the forests of the new world. Through the influence of another aspect of nature, my flower of love, my nameless phantom of the Armorican woods, became Atala, beneath the shades of Florida. M. de Malzeb encouraged the idea of this voyage, and increased my desire for it. I passed whole mornings with him, poring over maps, comparing the various charts of the Arctic Circle, calculating the distances from Bering Straits to the top of Hudson's Bay reading the different narratives of English, Dutch, French, Russian, Swedish, and Danish travellers and navigators. We traced out land routes by which to reach the shores of the Polar Sea, imagined difficulties to be surmounted and precautions to be taken against the rigour of the climate, the attacks of wild animals, and the want of provisions. This illustrious man said to me, If I were young, I would go with you. I would spare myself the sight of the crimes, cowardice, and folly which meet me here. But at my age, men must be content to stay and die where they are. Do not fail to write to me by every opportunity, to give me full accounts of your progress and your discoveries. I will introduce them to the notice of the ministers. It is a great pity that you do not understand botany. After such conversations I turned over to Ruffaut, Duhamel, Bernard de Jussieu, Gou, Jacquin, Rousseau's Dictionary, and a variety of elementary floras, then ran off to the Jardin du Roi, and already thought myself a Linnaeus. At length, in the month of January, 1791, I seriously made up my mind. The chaos of affairs was increasing. The very name of aristocrat sufficed to subject any one bearing it to persecution. The more moderate and conscientious a man's opinion was, the more it was suspected and spied upon. I therefore resolved to strike my tent. I left my brother and sisters in Paris, and set out for Brittany. At Fougere I met with the Marquis de la Rouerie, and asked him for a letter to General Washington. Colonel Armand, the name borne by the Marquis in America, had distinguished himself in the war of american independence in france he made himself known by the part he took in the royalist conspiracy which made some such touching victims in the decile family having lost his life while organizing this conspiracy he was afterwards exhumed and recognized and drew down misfortunes on his hosts and friends rival to lafayette and lausanne and forerunner of la roche jacquelin he was more clever than any of them he had fought oftener than the first carried off opera actresses like the second and would have been companion in arms to the third he was then scouring the woods in brittany accompanied by an american major and with an ape seated on the croup the law students at rennes were fond of him his boldness in action and his freedom of ideas pleased them he had been one of the twelve breton gentlemen imprisoned in the bastille his appearance and manners were elegant his air manly his face intelligent and pleasing he somewhat resembled the portraits of the young noblemen of the league i chose st malo as my port of embarkation in order that I might take leave of my mother. In the third book of these memoirs I have spoken of my visit en passant to Combourg, and of the feelings which there oppressed me. At Saint-Malo I remained two months, busied in preparations for my voyage, as I had once before been at the same place for my projected departure for India. I made arrangements for my passage with a captain named Desjardins. He had engaged to convey the Abbe Nago, head of the seminary at Saint-Sulpice, and several of the students under his charge, to Baltimore. These fellow voyages would have been more congenial to me four years before. From a zealous Christian as I had then been, I had now become an esprit fort, or to speak more truly, an esprit faible. This change in my religious opinions had been produced by reading books on philosophy. I truly believe that on one side a religious mind was, as it were, paralysed, that there were truths which could not reach it, however superior it might be in any other ways. It was this foolish pride which effected the change in my mind in a religious spirit i supposed a deficiency an absence of faculty which in fact exists in a philosophic spirit a limited intelligence imagines it sees everything 
because it keeps its eyes open. A superior intelligence consents to shut its eyes because it sees everything within. Another and final cause was the ceaseless despair which lay deep in the recesses of my heart. A letter of my brother's has fixed the date of my departure in my memory. He wrote to my mother from Paris, announcing the death of Mirabeau. Three days after the arrival of this letter, I rejoined the vessel in the roads. My luggage had all been previously sent on board. The anchor was weighed, a solemn moment among sailors. The sun was setting when the coasting pilot left us, after having safely guided our vessel out of the channel. The weather was gloomy, the breeze languid, and the waves beat heavily upon the rocks at a few cable lengths from the vessel. My eyes were fixed on Saint-Malo. I had just left my mother there in tears. I could see the belfries and domes of the churches where I had prayed with Lucille, the walls, the ramparts, the forts, the towers, and the strand, where I had passed my childhood with Cheryl and my other playfellows. I was deserting my country, torn with revolution, and at a time when she had lost a man whose place no one could fill. I was going far away, in equal uncertainty as regarded my country's destiny and my own. Who would, meanwhile, be lost to France or to me? Should I ever again see my country or my family? At nightfall a calm obliged us to lie by at the mouth of the roads. The lights in the town and in the watch-towers shone forth on the night. These lights, trembling beneath my paternal roof, seemed at once to smile on me, and to bid me adieu, illuminating the darkness around me and the deep shadow of the water among the rocks. I carried with me naught but my youth and my illusions. I quitted a world whose soil I had trodden, and whose stars I had counted, for a world where earth and sky were strangers to me. What was destined to befall me if I attained the aim of my voyage? Wandering by the Hyperborean shores, the years of discord which have crushed so many generations in their thundering course would have passed silently over my head. The face of society would have been renewed, and I absent. Probably I should never have had the misfortune to write. My name would have remained unknown, or would only have been linked with a peaceful celebrity below the standard of fame, disdained by envy and left to happiness. Who knows whether I should ever have recrossed the Atlantic? whether I might not have fixed my dwelling like a conqueror amid his conquests, among the solitudes I had explored and discovered in risk and peril. But no, I was destined to return to my country, to a change of misery, to be entirely different to what I had ever been before. This sea in whose lap I was born was now to become the cradle of my second life. I was born on it, on this my first voyage, as on the bosom of my nurse, as in the arms of the confidant of my first tears and my first pleasures. The ebb of the tide in default of a breeze was gradually carrying us out to sea. The lights on shore grew fainter and at last disappeared. Exhausted with reverie, with vague regrets and hopes still more vague, I retired to my cabin and lay down in my hammock, rocked to the sound of the waves, caressing the sides of the vessel. The wind rose, the unfurled sails, till then hanging useless by the mast, spread themselves to meet it, and when I went on deck next morning we were out of sight of France. Here my destinies change. As Byron says, Again to see. End of chapter 13Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part 2, by Francois René de Chateaubriand, Chapter 14. London, from April till September 1822. Revised in December 1846. Introduction. Thirty-one years after my departure for America as a simple sub-lieutenant, I set out for London with a passport couched in the following terms. Les ai passé sa seigneurie le vicomte de Chateaubriand, père de France, Ambassadeur du roi pour sa majesté britannique, etc. His Lordship Viscount de Chateaubriand, peer of France, and ambassador from the King to the King of Great Britain, etc. There was no description of the person. My dignity was to convey a sufficient knowledge of my face everywhere. A steamboat, ordered for my special use, conveyed me from Calais to Dover. On landing at Dover, April 5th, 1822, a salute was fired from the forts. An officer sent by the commandant came to offer me a guard of honour. On my arrival at the ship, the master and servants of the hotel received us with bare heads and profound bows, and the mayoress of the town sent me an invitation to a soiree in the name of the ladies of the borough. Mr. Billing, one of the attaches to the embassy, awaited my arrival. 
a dinner of enormous dishes of fish and huge joints of beef was served up for his excellency the ambassador who had no appetite and was not at all fatigued the people gathered in crowds under the windows of the hotel and made the air resound with huzzas the officer from the garrison returned and in spite of my refusal placed sentinels at the door on the next day after distributing a great deal of money belonging to the king my master i set out for london in the midst of salvos of artillery in a light carriage drawn by four beautiful horses and driven at a rapid pace by two gaily dressed postilions the servants followed in other carriages and outriders wearing my livery accompanied the cortege we passed through canterbury attracting the eyes of john ball and of the persons in the various equipages which we met on the road at blackheath a place formerly haunted by highwaymen i found a new village and soon after we came full in view of the immense cloud of smoke with which london is constantly covered having plunged into this gulf of coal smoke as into the jaws of tartarus and being driven across the whole city the streets of which i recognised we alighted at the hotel of the embassy in portland place monsieur le comte georges de caramont the chargé d'affaires the vicomte de marcellus and the baron de decaze secretaries to the embassy and other officials received me with dignified respect the whole of the ushers porters and servants of the hotel were stationed in the park cards were presented to me from the members of the king's government and the foreign ambassadors who had been already informed of my approaching arrival on the seventeenth of may in the year of grace seventeen ninety three on my way to the same city of london i landed at southampton from jersey no mayoress paid any regard to my transit the mayor of the town mr william smith gave me a card of the route to london on the eighteenth accompanied with an extract from the alien bill the description given of me in english was as follows francis de chateaubriand french officer in the emigrant army five feet four inches high brown hair and moustaches the cheapest conveyance was taken along with some sailors on leave the humblest places of refreshment were selected and poor ill and unknown i entered into the large and opulent city under the rule of mr pitt i went to an humble lodging at six shillings a week in the upper floor of a corn dealer's house in a small street running into tottenham court road ah monseigneur que votre vie donne aujourd'hui si remplie de faire de ces heureux temps another species of obscurity now overshadowed me in london my political position threw my literary reputation into the shade there was not a fool in the three kingdoms who did not prefer the ambassador of louis the eighteenth to the author of the genie du christianisme we shall see how the matter will turn out after my death or when i shall cease to replace the duc de Caz at the court of george the fourth a succession as extraordinary as the other parts of my life when in london as the ambassador of france one of my greatest pleasures was to leave my carriage at the corner of a square and to walk through the lanes which i long ago frequented and the populous and cheap suburbs where misery takes refuge under the protection of similar suffering the unknown abodes which i haunted along with my companions in distress not knowing whether i might have bread for the morrow what a contrast with the magnificent service of the embassy at the doors of the humble and poor dwellings which i used to frequent i met none but strange faces i no longer saw my fellow-countrymen wandering about so easily recognised by their gestures their walk the style and cut of their dress i saw no more of those martyr priests with their low collars large three-cornered hats and long black worn-out coats whom the english saluted as they passed the eye now everywhere fell upon new streets bordered with palaces noble bridges and well-planted promenades the open fields covered with herds of cows near portland place had been converted into regent's park a burying ground which was visible through my attic window had disappeared in the midst of the buildings of a manufactory as i went to lord liverpool's it was with difficulty i could recognise the open space where the scaffold of charles i had been erected and new buildings in total forgetfulness of memorable events had been brought close upon the statue of charles the second in the midst of insipid pomps how do i regret that season of tribulation and tears in which i mingled my sorrows with a colony of unfortunate exiles so true is it that everything changes and that misfortune fades away even like prosperity what has now become of my brothers in exile some are dead others have gone through various destinies like me they have seen their neighbours and friends disappear from the scene they have been less happy in their native land than they were upon a foreign soil had we not in this foreign land our meetings our amusements our fete and above all our youth mothers of families and young girls who began life in adversity brought home the fruits of their labour in order to enjoy a festive dance of their native country attachments were formed after the labours of the day in the conversations of the evening on hampstead heath or over the fields around primrose hill in chapels adorned by our hands amidst ruined buildings we offered up our prayers on the twenty first of january and the anniversary of the queen's death deeply moved by the funeral oration delivered by the emigrant cure of our village 
we were accustomed to go along the banks of the thames sometimes to see ships laden with the riches of the world brought into the docks and sometimes to admire the beautiful country houses at richmond we so poor so destitute in all these things enjoyed a real happiness when i returned in eighteen twenty two instead of being received by my friend trembling with cold who opened the door of a common attic and addressed me in familiar language who lay upon his humble couch near mine covered over with his scanty garments the only lamp the light of the moon i now passed in a blaze of light through two rows of servants into a room where stood five or six respectful secretaries overwhelmed in my passage by the words monseigneur my lord your excellency monsieur l'ambassadeur i at length reached a drawing-room ornamented with silk and gold i pray you gentlemen leave me a truce to these my lords what do you wish me to do for you go laugh in your offices just as if i was not here do not pretend to make me believe there is anything real in this masquerade do not think i am fool enough to imagine that i have changed my nature merely because i have changed my dress the marquis of londonderry has just called you say the duke of wellington has left his card mr canning has also been here lady jersey expects me to dinner to meet mr broom lady gridia hopes for my presence at ten o'clock in her box at the opera lady mansfield at midnight at almax mercy where shall i hide myself who will deliver me who will snatch me away from these persecutions return o charming days of my misery and solitude revive companions of my exile come my old comrades with your camp beds and pallets of straw let us go into the country into the little garden of an humble tavern and drink a cup of tea seated on a wooden bench and let us talk of our foolish hopes and our ungrateful country let us detail our troubles and our means of mutual assistance how to succour some of our friends more necessitous than even ourselves such were my feelings and thoughts during the first days of my embassy in london i could only escape from the annoyances which beset me under my roof by indulging in mournful recollections in kensington gardens these gardens have undergone no change with the exception of the growth of the trees in their solitary walks the birds still build their nests in peace the same fashion of meeting in these gardens no longer exists as when madame recamier the most beautiful of frenchwomen was accustomed to appear there followed by a crowd it affords me great pleasure to gaze from the green sward at the long lines of horses and fashionable carriages on the drives in hyde park among which is seen my own empty tilbury whilst i having resumed the character of a poor gentleman emigre saunter up the walk where the exiled confessor was formerly accustomed to read his breviary it was in these same gardens i first projected the essai historique there looking over the journal of my wanderings beyond sea i drew from it the loves of atala in these gardens after having wandered to a distance into the country under a lowering sky glowing and as it were penetrated with a polar light i drew the first sketches of the passions of rene by night i laid up the harvest of my reveries by day in the essai historique and in the natchez the two manuscripts proceeded abreast although i was often in want of paper to record them and fastened the leaves together by bits of wood from the window-sill for want of thread these scenes of my first inspirations always make me feel their power by reflecting the mild light of my recollections on the present and thus i feel a suitable disposition to resume my pen how many hours are lost in embassies time is no more wanting to me here than in berlin to continue my memoirs an edifice which i am constructing from bones and ruins in london my secretaries were eager in the morning to go to picnics and in the evening to balls with all my heart the men peter valentine and lewis in their turn were off to the alehouse and the women rose peggy and maria for a walk i was delighted at it the key of the outer door was left with me and the care of the house was committed to his excellency the ambassador if any one knocks he will open the door every one has gone out here am i alone let us resume our work i have just said that twenty-two years ago i made the first sketches of the natchez and atala in london in my memoirs i am precisely at the period of my travels in america this will perfectly accord let us suppress these two-and-twenty years as if they were in reality blotted out from my life and let us set out for the forests of the new world the account of my embassy will recur if it please god at its proper date but if at the least i remain here a few months i shall have leisure to proceed from the falls of niagara to the army of the princes in germany and from the army of the princes to my retreat in england the ambassador of the king of france can relate the history of the french emigre in the very place to which he was exiled End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two by francois rene de chateaubriand 
chapter fifteen london from april till september eighteen twenty two crossing the ocean the preceding book closed with my embarkation at st malo our ship soon cleared the channel and the swell from the west announced the atlantic it is very difficult for those who have never been at sea to form an idea of the feelings experienced when nothing whatever is visible from the deck of the ship except the solemn face of the deep there is a certain independence in a sailor's life which arises from the absence of land the passions of men are left behind upon the shore between the world which is left and that after which we seek the element on which we are born is the only substitute for love and for country no more duties to discharge no more visits to make no more newspapers no politics the very language of sailors is not that of common life it is a language such as that spoken by the ocean and the sky the calm and the tempest you dwell in a universe of waters amongst creatures whose dress tastes manners and countenance bear no resemblance to the dwellers on land they possess the hardihood of the sea-wolf and the quickness of a bird their brow is traced by no marks of the cares of society the wrinkles which traverse it resemble the folds of the shortened sail and are less the effect of age than of winds and waves the skin of these beings impregnated with salt is red and hard like the surface of the rock lashed by the billows sailors have a passion for their ship they weep with regret on parting from it and with joy on returning to it they find it impossible to remain at home after having sworn a thousand times no longer to expose themselves to the dangers of the sea they cannot resist returning to it again as a young man is unable to tear himself from his beloved even although she prove tempestuous and faithless in the docks of london and plymouth it is by no means rare to find sailors who have been born on shipboard and from their childhood to old age have seldom been ashore their acquaintance with land is formed from the deck of their floating cradle mere spectators of a world into which they have not entered in a life reduced to so small a space the clouds above and the deep below everything assumes the forms of life to the sailor an anchor a sail a mast a gun are the objects of his affection and each of them has its history the sail was rent on the coast of labrador the master sailmaker put on the patch which you see the anchor saved the vessel when she was drifted after the loss of other anchors into the middle of the coral rocks of the sandwich islands the mast was broken in a hurricane off the cape of good hope it was only a single pole it is much stronger now that it is made of two the gun is the only one which was not dismounted in the battle of the chesapeake the most interesting news on board are that the lead has been just heaved the ship is making ten knots the sky is clear at noon an observation has been taken we are in such a latitude the ship's place is marked so many leagues have been sailed the declination of the needle is so many degrees we have gone further north the sand in the hour-glass does not run freely there will be rain procellaria have been observed in the ship's track clear up for a squall flying fish have appeared to the south the weather is about to become calm a bright spot has appeared in the clouds to the west it is a sign of wind it will blow from that quarter to-morrow the colour of the sea is changed pieces of wood and seaweed are observed floating gulls and ducks have been seen a small bird has just perched on the shrouds a good lookout must be kept land is near and it is dangerous to come on the coast by night in the pen there is a favourite and so to speak a sacred cock which has outlived all the others he is famous for having crowed during a battle as if he had been in a farmyard amongst the hens below deck there is a cat which has sailed twice round the world and been saved from shipwreck on a barrel the ship's boys give the cock biscuits steeped in wine and malou has the privilege when he pleases of sleeping in the mate's berth the old sailor is like an old labourer their harvests are different it is true the sailor has led a wandering life the labourer has never quitted his field but both are equally well acquainted with and predict futurity whilst they plough their furrows to the one the lark the redbreast and the nightingale are prophets to the other the storm-birds and the kingfisher they retire in the evening the former to his berth the latter to his hut frail dwellings but the storm that shakes them does not disturb easy consciences if the wind tempestuous is blowing still no danger they descry the guiltless heart its boon bestowing soothes them with its lullaby etc etc the sailor knows not when death may take him unawares or on what coast he may lose his life 
perhaps when his last sigh has mingled with the wind he shall be launched into the bosom of the waves bound to two oars to continue his voyage perhaps he may be buried in a desert island which will never again be visited even as he has slept isolated in his hammock in the middle of the ocean the ship alone forms an object of interest sensible to the slightest movement of the helm a winged steed she obeys the hand of the pilot as a horse yields to the hand of the rider the beauty of the masts and cordage the activity of the sailors in climbing the shrouds and handing the sails the different aspects under which the ship presents herself sometimes heeling under the power of a contrary gale from the south and sometimes running all sail set before a northerly breeze combine to form of this almost intelligent machine one of the greatest triumphs of human ingenuity one while the surge with its foam breaks and dashes against the hull at another the peaceful waves yield a ready and easy passage to the prow the flags streamers and sails complete the beauty of this palace of neptune the lower sails in all their extent are bulged out like vast cylinders the upper ones crossed in the middle by the buntline resemble the bosom of a siren driven on by a powerful wind with her keel she furrows the field of the sea as with a ploughshare on this ocean road along which there are neither trees villages towns towers belfries nor tombs to be seen on this way marked neither by columns nor milestones whose only limits are the waves whose relays are the winds and whose lights are the stars the meeting of other vessels forms the most pleasing adventure except when one happens to be in quest of unknown countries and seas ships discover each other by their telescopes on the distant horizon and immediately take means to run close to each other the crew and the passengers crowd the decks the ships approach hoist their colours shorten sail and heave to as soon as all is silent the two captains stationed on their respective poops hail with the speaking trumpet what ship is that of what port captain's name whence from how many days out latitude and longitude a good voyage they shake out the reefs the sails fill the crew and passengers of the two ships look at each other as they speed on their course without uttering a word some are hastening to the climes of asia others to europe which will equally see them die time urges on its course and separates travellers upon land more quickly still than the wind separates them on the ocean a signal is made from afar farewell the common port is eternity and if the vessel met should be that of cook or la perouse the boatswain on board our malone vessel was an old supercargo named pierre villeneuve his name alone made me entertain a regard for him for it was that of my good nurse he had served in india with de Souffrin, and in america under count d'estaing and had been in several engagements seated in the fore part of the ship near the bowsprit like a veteran beneath a vine in his little garden in the convent of the invalides pierre whilst chewing a quid of tobacco which puffed out his cheek as if he had a swelled face used to describe to me the moment of clearing the decks the effects of the discharges of artillery the havoc caused by the shot in its rebound amongst the guns their carriages and the timber work i made him tell me about the indians the negroes and the colonists i asked him how the people were clothed how the trees grew what was the colour of the earth and the sky and what the taste of the fruits whether pineapples were better than peaches and palm trees more beautiful than oaks he illustrated everything by comparisons taken from things with which i was acquainted the palm tree was like a great cabbage the dress of an indian like that of my grandmother the camel resembled a hunchback ass and all the people of the east and especially the chinese he described as poltroons and thieves villeneuve was from brittany and we never failed to conclude our conversation by praising the incomparable beauty of our own country the bell generally interrupted us in our conferences it announced the quarters the hour for dressing for the review of the crew for meals every morning at a certain signal the crew ranged in line on the deck exchanged the blue shirt they each wore for others which were hanging to dry among the shrouds the shirts they took off were instantly washed in tubs in which this troop of foci also soaped their brown faces and tarry hands at their midday and evening meal the sailors seated in circles with a bowl in the centre of each dipped their pewter spoons in regular and equal turns into the soup it contained which was kept in perpetual motion by the rolling of the vessel those who were not hungry sold their allowance of biscuit and salt meat to their comrades for a quid of tobacco or a glass of brandy the passengers took their meals in the captain's cabin when the weather was fine an awning was spread over the quarter-deck and we dined in view of the blue expanse of sea 
speckled here and there with the light foam raised by the breeze wrapped in my cloak i lay down at night on the deck and gazed up at the stars the swelling sails sent back upon me the freshness of the breeze which was rocking me beneath the celestial dome i lay in a dreamy half slumbering state with the wind blowing upon me and the sky appeared to change with my dreams the passengers on board a vessel form a society of an entirely different stamp from that of the officers and crew they belong to another element their destinies belong to the land some are hastening to seek fortune others repose some are returning to their country some quitting it others are voyaging for the purpose of becoming acquainted with the manners and customs of different nations or of studying science or art there is leisure enough while they are thrown together in this wandering hostelry which travels with the traveller to become acquainted to hear many a story and adventure to conceive antipathies to contract friendships when among this temporary society there are any of those young women partly of english partly of indian race who unite the beauty of clarissa to the delicacy of sacontala then chains are wreathed united and disjoined by the perfume breezes of ceylon sweet and fleeting as they End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter sixteen london from april till september eighteen twenty two francis tullet christopher columbus Camerons. among my fellow-passengers was an englishman named francis tullock he had served in the artillery was a painter a musician a mathematician and spoke several languages the abbe nago superior of the sulpicians having met with the english officer converted him and was now taking his neophyte to baltimore i made acquaintance with tullock and as i was then a profound philosopher urged him to return to his relations the sight constantly before our eyes filled him with boundless admiration we rose in the night when the deck was abandoned to the officer of the watch and a few sailors silently smoking their pipes tutae quore silent the vessel rolled and heaved at the will of the slow heavy billows while sparks of fire seemed to be emitted from the white line of foam which ran along her sides myriads of stars beaming in the deep azure of the heavenly vault above us a shoreless ocean the infinite in the heavens and in the waters never did the idea of the greatness of god so weigh upon my soul as during these nights when i had immensity above me immensity at my feet west winds and calms delayed our progress on the fourth of may we were only as far north as the azores on the sixth towards eight in the morning we were in sight of the peak of pico this volcano long reared its fiery head above unnavigated seas a useless beacon by night an unseen signal by day there is something magical in seeing land thus rise from the depths of the sea christopher columbus amidst his mutinous crew on the point of returning to europe without having attained the object of his voyage saw a distant light gleaming on a shore which was hidden from him by the darkness of night the flight of birds had guided him towards america the light on the hearth of the savage revealed a new universe to him columbus must have experienced something of the feeling attributed in scripture to the creator when after having drawn the world from the realm of chaos he saw that his work was good Vid it deus quod es et bonum columbus created a world one of the first biographies of the genoese navigator was that which justiniani when publishing a hebrew psalter placed in the form of a note below the psalm celi enarat gloriam dei vasco da gama could not have been less amazed when in the year fourteen ninety eight he touched the coast of malabar the whole globe then appeared changed a new nature opened to view the veil which for thousands of centuries had concealed a part of the universe was lifted the country of the sun was revealed the place whence he daily comes forth like a bridegroom or a giant tanquam sponsus ut gigas other nations came face to face with the wise and brilliant east whose mysterious history was mingled with the travels of pythagoras the conquests of alexander and the recollections of the crusades and whose perfumes were conveyed to us across the fields of arabia and the seas of greece europe sent a poet to salute it the swan of the tagus raised its sad sweet song on the banks of the indus Camerons borrowed from them their lustre their renown and their misfortune he left them but their riches the azores gractosa island 
when gonzalo vilo the maternal grandfather of camoens discovered a part of the archipelago of the azores he ought had he foreseen the future to have reserved to himself the possession of six feet of land to cover the bones of his grandson we anchored in bad roads a rocky bottom covered by forty-five fathoms of water the swelling hills of graciosa island before which we had moored presented outlines somewhat resembling the curves of an etruscan vase they were clothed with the verge of the cornfields from which an agreeable frumentatious odour peculiar to the harvests of the azores was wafted on the breeze at intervals through this verdant expanse ran the division of the fields formed of volcanic stones half black half white heaped irregularly together an abbey a monument of an old world on a new soil stood at the summit of a low hill and at the foot of this hill on a pebbly beach appeared the red roofs of the town of santa cruz the whole island with its features of bay cape creek and promontory was reflected inverted in the sea rocks rising perpendicularly from the waves formed its outer enclosure beyond graciosa in the background appeared the cone of the volcano rising from a cupola of clouds and terminating the aerial perspective it was decided that i should land in company with tulloch and the first lieutenant the chaloupe was launched and soon brought us to the shore a distance of about two miles we perceived some movement on the coast and a barge came towards us as soon as it came within hearing we saw that it contained a number of monks they hailed us in portuguese italian english and french and we replied in the same languages alarm reigned on shore for ours was the first vessel of large tonnage which had ventured to moor in the dangerous roads where we were waiting for wind and tide and besides it was the first time that these islanders had seen the tricolor ensign they did not know whether we might not have come from algiers or tunis neptune had not recognized the flag so gloriously borne by sibylle when they saw however that we looked like human beings and that we understood what was said their joy was extreme the monks took us into their barge and we rowed gaily towards santa cruz there we landed after some difficulty as the surf was very high the whole island flocked to see us four or five alguazils armed with rusty pikes took possession of us his majesty's uniform attracted honours to me and i passed for the important man of the deputation we were taken to the governor's apartment a paltry little room where his excellency dressed in a shabby green coat which had formerly been laced with gold gave us solemn audience and permission to revittal our monks conducted us to their monastery an edifice surrounded by balconies commodious and well lighted tulloch had found a fellow-countryman the principal monk who arranged all our proceedings and took most of the trouble on himself was a jersey sailor whose vessel and its whole cargo had been wrecked off graciosa he was the only one of the crew who escaped with life and as he was not wanting in intelligence showed great docility in receiving the instruction of the catechists he learned portuguese and a few words of latin his being an englishman tended to his favour at the monastery and they converted and made a monk of him the jersey sailor large clothed and fed in peace beside the altar found this sort of life much easier than being sent aloft to furl the mizzen topsail he still remembered his old trade however and having been so long deprived of the pleasure of speaking his own language was delighted to meet with any one who understood it and laughed and swore like any pilot he was our guide through the island the village houses built of planks and stones were embellished with exterior galleries which gave a clean air to these huts as they introduced a good deal of light the peasants who were almost all vine dressers were half naked and bronzed by the sun the women were small and dark as mulattoes but sprightly and naively coquettish with their nosegays of syringa and chaplets adorning their heads or necks the slopes of the hills were thickly covered with vines the wine produced from which resembled that of payal water was rare but wherever a fountain bubbled there grew a fig tree with a little oratory beside it its porch painted in fresco through the arches of the porch were to be seen set as it were in a frame views of parts of the island and glimpses of the sea on one of these fig trees i saw a flock of teal settle they were blue but not web-footed the tree had no leaves but a quantity of red fruit set like crystals when it was covered with these cerulean birds each hanging its wings its fruit appeared to be of a splendid purple colour and itself to have suddenly put forth an azure foliage the Azores were probably known to the Carthaginians. It is certain that Phoenician coins have been dug up in the island of Corvo. The first modern navigators who landed on this island found, it is said, an equestrian statue, its right arm extended, and pointing towards the west. This statue may, however, very possibly belong to the class of inventions which embellish the old marine descriptions. In Natchez I have supposed that Chactas, on his return to Europe, landed at the island of Corvo, and here met with the mysterious statue he thus expresses the ideas which occupied my mind at graciosa 
and revive the tradition in my memory i approached this extraordinary monument on its base perpetually washed by the sea foam were graven unknown characters moss and sea salt were gradually eating away the surface of the ancient bronze the halcyon perched on the cask of the colossus at intervals sent forth its plaintive notes quantities of small shells had clung to the sides and to the brown mane of the courser and on putting my ear to the wide nostrils confused murmuring noises seemed to issue from them a good supper was served to us at the monastery after our walk and we spent the night in drinking with our hosts towards noon next day our provisions having been previously embarked we returned to the vessel the monks took charge of our letters for europe the vessel had become endangered by the sudden rising of a strong south-east wind the anchor was veered but it became entangled in the rocks and was lost as was expected we got under way and soon left the azores behind End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter seventeen london april till september eighteen twenty two sailors games island of st pierre frag pelagis miscire probes quo cabasa laxo o muse aid me to show that i know the sea on which i now spread my sails so said six hundred years ago william the breton my fellow-countryman restored to the sea i again began to contemplate its solitudes but through the mist of my ideal world rose like severe monitors france and real events my retreat during the day when i wished to avoid my fellow-passengers was the round top of the main mast my agility in climbing to it gave me the applause of the sailors here i seated myself in full view of the great waste of waters the immense vault of heaven hung as it were with azure looked like a canvas prepared for the future creations of a great painter the colour of the water was that of liquid glass through the ravines of its undulating mountains were to be seen vistas of the great ocean desert these ever-changing water views made me understand the comparison in scripture where it speaks of the earth reeling like a drunken man before the lord at one moment the immense space of sea and sky appeared narrow and confined for want of a point of comparison but let a wave raise its head or curve itself into an imitation of a distant coast or a shoal of sea-dogs pass along the horizon and immediately a standard of measurement was furnished the vast extent was fully revealed when a haze rising on the pelagian surface seemed even to add to the immensity around after descending from my eyrie as in former days from my nest in the willow for i was perpetually reduced to a solitary life i supped on a sea-biscuit a lemon and some sugar and then lay down either on the deck in my cloak or below the poop in my cot i had but to stretch out my arms to reach from my bed to my coffin the wind drove us northwards and we touched at the bank of newfoundland some floating pieces of ice roamed through a cold pale mist the sons of neptune have particular games which have been handed down to them by their predecessors on crossing the line one must make up one's mind to receive baptism the same ceremonies observe under the tropics the same at the bank of newfoundland and wherever it may be performed the chief of the masquerade is always goodman tropic tropic and hydropic are synonymous in sailors ideas so goodman tropic is always extremely portly even when beneath his tropics he is clothed in all the sheepskins and furred jackets to be found on board he crouches on the round top uttering roars at intervals every one below watches him he begins to descend the shrouds heavy as a bear staggering like silenus on reaching the poop he renews his roars bounds about seizes a bucket fills it with salt water and throws it over the principal man among those who have not crossed the line or who have never gone so far north as the ice latitude people take refuge below decks climb on the hatchways and up the masts and father tropic pursues the game is finished by the sailors getting some money for drink such are the games of amphitrite which homer would have celebrated as he did proteus if old oceanus had been thoroughly known when ulysses lived but at that time nothing was yet to be seen of him but his head at the columns of hercules his hidden body covered the world we steered in the direction of the islands of st pierre and michelon in search of a new port as we were approaching the former one morning between ten o'clock and noon we were near going on shore its coast loomed through the fog like a dark shapeless mass we cast anchor before the capital of the island 
the town was not visible but we heard the sounds on shore the passengers hastened to land the superior of saint sulpice continually harassed by sea-sickness was so weak that he was obliged to be carried on shore i took a private lodging and waited till a gust of wind should drive away the fog and show me the place in which i was to live and so to speak the countenances of my hosts in this land of shadows the port and roadstead of saint pierre lie between the eastern coast of the island and a small islet called l'île aux chiens which protects them from the sea the harbour called the barachois runs deep into the land and terminates in a brackish swamp the mass of the island consists of barren promontories some detached towering steep from the shore others with a strip of level boggy land at their base the signal posts on the cape are seen from the town the governor's residence stands opposite to the landing-place where are also the church the rectory and the arsenal near this also is the house of the harbour-master and the captain of the port the only street in the town stretches along the pebbles on the beach i dined two or three times with the governor who was very obliging and polite on the glacis of the fort he cultivated a few european leguminous plants and after dinner he showed me what he called his garden a sweet and delicious perfume of the heliotrope was wafted from a small patch of beans in flower it was not borne to us by a breeze from our country but by a fierce wind from newfoundland which had no connection with the exiled plant no sympathy of recollections or pleasure this perfume not breathed by beauty not purified in its bosom not shed upon its steps this perfume removed from its clime its culture and its wonted admirers brought with it all the melancholy feelings of regret of absence and of youth from the garden we climbed up the heights and stopped at the foot of the flagstaff on the signal post the new french flag floated over our heads and like the woman in virgil we wept flentes as we looked at the sea it separated us from our native land the governor was uneasy he belonged to the fallen party he was moreover weary of this retreat fit only for a visionary like myself but a rude sojourn for a man engaged in business or one who no longer feels a master passion which makes one indifferent to the rest of the world my host inquired about the revolution i asked for news of the northwest passage he was the advance guard of the desert but he knew nothing of the eskimo and received nothing from canada except partridges one morning i had gone alone to the cap a l'aigle to see the sun rising from the direction of france there a winter torrent formed a cascade whose last bound reached the sea i sat down upon a projection of the rock with my feet hanging over the waves which rolled at the base of the cliff a young sea nymph appeared on the higher declivities of the promontory her feet were bare though it was cold as she walked over the dew her dark hair was confined in tresses by an india muslin handkerchief wound round her head and on the top of the handkerchief she wore a bonnet in the form of a ship or a cradle made of the reeds of the country a bouquet of wild lilacs adorned her bosom which was set off by the whiteness of her bodice from time to time she stooped down to gather the leaves of an aromatic plant called by the islanders te naturel with one hand she threw the leaves into a basket which she carried in the other she perceived me without any fear she came and sat down beside me placed her basket near her on the ground and began like myself with her legs dangling over the sea to look at the sun we remained some minutes without speaking at last i took courage and said what are you gathering the season for seaweed is past she raised her large black eyes timid and bright and answered i am gathering tea she handed me her basket are you taking the tea to your father and mother my father is out fishing with guillaume what do you do in the winter on the island we weave nets and fish in the ponds by breaking holes in the ice on sundays we go to mass and vespers or we chant the canticles and then we play on the snow and watch the boys hunting white bears will your father soon return oh no the captain takes the ship to genoa with guillaume but guillaume won't he return oh yes next season on the return of the fishermen he will bring me among his wares a striped silk corset a muslin petticoat and a black necklace and you will be adorned for the wind the mountain and the sea would you wish me to send you a bodice a petticoat and a necklace oh no she rose took up her basket and darted off down a steep path along a forest of pines singing as she went with a loud voice a canticle of the missions tout boulant d'une ardeur immortelle c'est vers dire que tant mes désirs in her descent she started numbers of those beautiful birds called aigrette from the plumes of feathers on their heads she seemed as if she were one of the flock as soon as she reached the sea she sprang into a boat spread the sail and seated herself at the helm she might have been taken for fortune she disappeared 
Oh, yes. Oh, no. Guillaume, the image of the young sailor on the sea in the midst of the winds, changed the wild rocks of Saint-Pierre into a land of delight. L'isole di fortuna ora vedete. We passed fifteen days in the island. From its desolate coast may be seen the still wilder and more barren shores of Newfoundland. The mountains in the interior form diverging chains, the highest of which stretch towards the Bay of Rodriguez. In the valleys, granite rocks, mixed with red and greenish mica, are clothed with masses of lichens and dicranum. Several small lakes are fed by the streams which run from the Vigi, the Corval, the Pandisuc, the Cagariu, and the Tete Galante. These marshes are known by the names of the ponds of the Savoyard, of Cape Noir, of Ravenel, of Colombier, and of Cap Alegre. When the whirlwinds strike these ponds, their violence scatters and divides the shallow waters, so as to show here and there portions of the submarine meadows, which are again speedily covered over by the returning waves. The flora of Saint-Pierre is the same as that of Lapland and the Straits of Magellan. The varieties of the vegetable world decrease as the pole is approached, and at Spitzbergen there are not found more than forty species of phanerogamous plants. By changing their locality, the whole genera of plants become extinct. Some whose habitation is the icy steppes of the north become denizens of the mountains in the south. Others, which delight in the tranquil atmosphere of dense forests, decreasing in vigour and size, perish when exposed to the stormy blasts of the ocean. In St. Pierre, the marsh myrtle, Vicinium fuliginorum, is reduced to the state of a creeper. It will soon be buried in the dog's bane which constitutes its soil. A travelling plant, I have taken precautions to disappear on the shores of the sea, my native soil. The slopes of the hills in St. Pierre are covered with tacamahacas, diaspiros, larch and spruce firs, whose shoots are used for producing an antiscorbutic beer. None of these trees grow beyond the height of a man. The ocean storm bends and prostrates them like ferns. Then, gliding under these forests of bushes, it lifts them up again, but it meets neither trunks, branches, arches, nor echoes to respond to its roar, and makes no more noise than upon a heath. These rickety woods form a striking contrast with the large forests of Newfoundland, whose neighbouring coasts lie within sight, and whose fir trees are adorned with the silver lichen, Alectoria tricodis. The white bears seem to have hung their skins on the branches of these trees, of which many form the strange creepers. The swamps of this island of Jacques Cartier contain paths trodden by those bears, which nearly resemble the rural paths in the neighbourhood of a sheepfold. The howlings of these hungry animals are heard through the whole night, and the traveller only feels himself safe by the no less mournful sounds of the sea, whose rude and inhospitable waves become companions and friends. The northern extremity of Newfoundland reaches the latitude of Cape Charles I in Labrador, and a few degrees higher the polar regions commence. If we only believe travellers, these regions have their charms. When the sun approaches the earth in the evening, it seems to remain stationary, and again begins to ascend instead of sinking below the horizon. The mountains clothed with snow, the valleys covered with white mosses, on which the reindeer browse, the seas alive with whales and speckled over with floating ice, form a most brilliant scene, illuminated at the same time by the glowing light of the west, and the splendours of the aurora. It is difficult to know whether one is present at the creation or the end of the world. A small bird like that which sings by night in our woods warbles forth its plaintive note. Then love prompts the Eskimo to seek his expecting companion on the rocky ice. These marriages of men at the utmost bounds of the earth are neither destitute of pomp nor happiness. End of chapter 17《Chapter 18 of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 18 of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768 to 1800, Part 2, by François René de Chateaubriand. Chapter 18. London from April till September, 1822. Coast of Virginia. Setting sun danger landing in america separation from fellow passengers tulloch having taken on board supplies and replaced the anchor lost at graciosa we quitted st pierre steering to the south we reached latitude thirty eight degrees calms detained us at a short distance from the coast of maryland and virginia a clear sky had succeeded the fogs of the northern regions we were not in sight of land but perceived distinctly the smell of the pine forests the daybreaks and mornings, the rising and setting of the sun, and the twilights and nights were magnificent. 
I could never satisfy my desire of looking at Venus, whose rays enveloped me like the hairs of my Sophie long ago. One evening, as I sat reading in the captain's cabin, the bell rang for prayers. I went to mingle my supplications with those of my companions. The officers, together with the passengers, occupied the poop. The chaplain, book in hand, stood somewhat nearer the wheel, whilst the sailors crowded in groups around. We stood with our faces towards the prow. Every sail was felled. The globe of the sun, just about to plunge into the waves, appeared through the mist of the cordage in boundless space. It might have been said that by the rolling of the poop, the radiant luminary every instant changed its horizon. When I drew this picture, the whole of which you may see again in the Genie du Christianisme, my religious feelings were in complete harmony with the scene. But alas, when I was present in person, the old man was living in me. It was not God alone I was contemplating on the waves in the glory of his works. I saw an unknown woman and the miracles of her smile. The beauties of heaven seemed to me to spring from her breath. I would have sold eternity for one of her caresses. I figured to myself that her heart was beating behind this veil of the universe, which concealed her from my eyes. Oh, why was it not in my power to rend this curtain, to press this idealized beauty to my heart, and to enjoy the fullness of an affection which constituted the source of my inspirations, of my despair, and of my life? Whilst I was giving free course to these emotions, so suitable to my future career as a denizen of the woods, an accident was very near putting an end to my designs and my dreams. The heat was oppressive, the ship in a dead calm, without sails, and tottering under the weight of her masts, rolled excessively. Burnt upon the deck, and fatigued by the motion, I longed for a bath, and though we had no boats down, I threw myself from the bowsprit into the sea. At first all went well, and several passengers followed my example. I swam without taking heed to the ship, but I no sooner turned my head than I saw that the current was sweeping her far from me. The sailors, alarmed, had thrown out lines to the other swimmers. Sharks showed themselves near the ship, and guns were fired to drive them away. The current was so strong, as greatly to retard my return, by exhausting my strength. There was a gulf beneath me, and any moment a shark might have taken off an arm or a leg. The master and crew made all possible speed to let down a boat, but it was necessary to fix a tackle, and this consumed a great deal of time. By the greatest good fortune, a breeze almost imperceptible sprung up. The ship answered the helm, and was brought near me, I was not able to lay hold of the rope, but the companions of my rashness having clung to it, we were dragged to the side of the ship, and being at the extremity of the file, they pressed upon me with all their weight. In this way they hauled us up one by one, which was tedious. The rolling of the ship continued, and at every successive roll we were plunged six or seven feet into the sea, or suspended the same height in the air, like fish at the end of a line. At the last plunge I felt myself ready to faint, one roll more, and all was over. They drew me upon deck half dead. If I had been drowned, it would have been a good relief for myself and for others. Two days after this incident, we sighted land. My heart beat when the captain showed it to me. America, faintly traced by the tops of some maple trees emerging, as it were, from the sea. In the same manner, the palm trees afterwards indicated to me the mouths of the Nile. A pilot came on board, and we sailed into the Chesapeake. The same evening a boat was sent ashore for supplies of fresh provisions. I joined the party and soon set foot on American soil. Casting my eyes around me, I remained for some moments motionless. This continent, perhaps unknown through the whole duration of ancient times, and many centuries of modern, the first rude fortunes of the country and its second destiny since its discovery by Columbus, the dominion of European monarchy is shaken in this new world, societies finishing their career in young America. A republic of a kind hitherto unknown, announcing a change in the human mind, the part which my own country had had in these events, these seas and these shores partly indebted for their independence to the French flag and French blood, a great man springing up from the midst of discord and deserts, Washington inhabiting a great city where Penn had purchased a corner of the forests, the United States sending back to France a revolution which France had maintained by her arms, Finally, my own destinies, my virgin muse, which I was about to deliver over to the passion of a new nature, the discoveries which I was eager to attempt in these deserts, whose wide domain stretched far behind the narrow empire of foreign civilization, these were the things which passed through my mind. We made our way towards the house. Groves of Virginia cedars, mocking-birds and cardinals, by their form, note and colour, gave sure proofs of a new climate. The homestead, which we reached in about half an hour, consisted of an Englishman's farm and a Creole's cottage. Herds of European cows were pasturing on fields fenced in by rails, over which striped squirrels were disporting. 
blacks were engaged in cleaving wood and whites in cultivating tobacco a negress of about fourteen years of age of singular beauty almost without clothing like young knight opened the gate of the enclosure for us we bought some maize some fowls eggs and milk and returned to our vessel with our baskets and jars i presented my silk handkerchief to the young african my first reception in the land of liberty was given me by a slave we weighed anchor in order to make the roads and harbour of baltimore as we drew near the channel narrowed the waters became smooth and still and to all appearance we were sailing up a sluggish stream bordered with rows of trees baltimore came in view as if at the extremity of a lake opposite the city rose a woody hill at the bottom of which buildings began to spring up we made fast to the quay in the harbour i slept on board and did not go on shore till the following day i took up my quarters with my luggage at an inn the seminarists retired to the establishment prepared for them from whence they were dispersed over america what has become of francis tulloch the following letter was put into my hands in london on the twelfth of april eighteen twenty two thirty years have now rolled away my dear viscount since the period of our voyage to baltimore and it is very possible you may have forgotten even my name to judge however according to the feelings of my own heart which has always been true and faithful to you it is not so and i flatter myself you will not be displeased to see me again living almost opposite to one another as you will see by the place whence this letter is dated i am but too sensible how much circumstances separate us intimate but the slightest wish to see me and i will hasten to prove to you how truly i am as i have ever been your faithful friend and servant francis tulloch p s the distinguished rank you have now attained and to which you have so many and such just claims is before my mind but the agreeable recollection of the chevalier de chateaubriand is so dear to me that i cannot write to you at least for this time as an ambassador etc etc pardon the style out of regard to our former friendship thirty portland place friday april nineteenth sir tulloch is in london he has not become a priest and is married his romance is finished like my own this letter bears testimony to the truth of my memoirs and the faithfulness of my recollections who could have borne witness to an alliance and friendship of thirty years standing had not the contracting parties been alive and what a melancholy and retrograde perspective does this letter unroll in the year eighteen twenty two tulloch was in the same city nay in the same street with myself the door of his house almost opposite to mine just as we had met in the same ship on the same deck and occupied cabins just opposite to each other how many other friends shall i never meet again a man every evening on retiring to rest may count his losses it is only his own years which do not leave him although they continue to pass when he reviews them and calls them by name they answer present not one is wanting on the roll end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter nineteen london april till september eighteen twenty two philadelphia general washington baltimore like all the other principal towns of the united states was not nearly so large a place at the time i saw it as it has since become it was a pretty little catholic town clean and lively and its manners and society much resembled those of europe i paid my passage money to the captain and gave him a farewell dinner then took a place in the stage-coach which runs three times a week from baltimore to philadelphia and at four in the morning took my seat on it and found myself rolling along the highways of the new world the road by which we travelled traced rather than properly made traversed rather a flat country scarcely any trees scattered farms and villages a climate like that of france and swallows dipping into the waters as on the pond at combourg as we approached philadelphia we met peasants going to market public and private conveyances philadelphia appeared to me a handsome town with wide streets some of them planted running direct north and south east and west and intersecting each other at right angles the delaware flows in a line parallel to the street which runs along its western bank this river would be called considerable in europe in america it is thought nothing of its banks are flat and not picturesque at the time of my visit to it in the year seventeen ninety one philadelphia did not extend as far as the river schuylkill the ground between the town and the junction of the schuylkill and delaware was parcelled out in sections here and there a house was in course of being built philadelphia is monotonous in its appearance 
in general the great deficiency in the protestant cities of the united states is in the great works of architecture the young reformation refusing to sacrifice to the imagination has rarely erected domes lofty naves with their airy arches and twin towers such as those with which the ancient catholic religion has crowned europe no monument either at philadelphia new york or boston rises above the mass of walls and roofs and the eye is wearied by the sameness of this level i first took up my quarters at the inn but afterwards established myself in a boarding-house where i met st domingo colonists and frenchmen who had emigrated with very different ideas from myself a land of liberty offered an asylum to those who fled from the encroachments of liberty at home nothing can more strongly prove the high value of generous institutions than this voluntary exile of the partisans of absolute power to a country where the government is a pure democracy a man landing as i did in the united states filled with enthusiastic feeling for classical nations everywhere seeking the severity of primitive roman manners would naturally be much scandalized at finding instead of this luxury in equipages frivolity in conversation immorality in banking and gaming-houses and the noisy confusion of ballrooms and theatres at philadelphia i could have fancied myself in liverpool or bristol the appearance of the people was pleasing the quakeresses pretty with their grey dresses small plain bonnets and pale complexions at that time of my life i had a great admiration for republics although i did not believe their existence possible in our era of the world my idea of liberty pictured her such as she was among the ancients daughter of the manners of an infant society i knew her not as the daughter of enlightenment and the civilization of centuries as the liberty whose reality the representative republic has proved god grant it may be durable we are no longer obliged to work in our own little fields to curse arts and sciences and to wear long nails and beards if we would be free when i arrived at philadelphia general washington was not there and it was a week before he returned i saw him pass in a carriage whirled along by four spirited horses washington according to my ideas at that period was necessarily a cincinnatus but cincinnatus in a carriage was a little out of harmony with my republic of the year of rome two ninety six could the dictator washington be other than a rustic urging on his oxen and holding his plough but when i went to deliver my letter of introduction i found all the simplicity of an ancient roman a small house similar to those around it was the palace of the president of the united states no guards not even any men-servants i knocked and a young girl opened i asked if the general was at home she replied in the affirmative and i said i had a letter to deliver to him she asked my name but found it very difficult to pronounce and could not remember it then requested me to walk in led me along one of those narrow corridors which serve as vestibules to english houses and left me in a parlour where she begged me to wait for the general i was not moved or embarrassed neither greatness of soul nor splendour of fortune awe me i admire the former without feeling overwhelmed by it the latter inspires me with more pity than respect face of man will never confuse me after an interval of a few minutes the general entered tall calm and cold rather than noble in mien the engravings of him are good i silently handed him my letter he opened it and turned to the signature which he read aloud exclaiming colonel armand the marquis de la rouerie was known to him by this name and had signed the letter with it we sat down and i explained to him as well as i could the motive of my journey he answered me in english and french monosyllables and listened to me with a sort of astonishment i perceived this and said to him with some warmth but it is less difficult to discover the north-west passage than to create a nation as you have done well well young man cried he holding out his hand to me he invited me to dine with him on the following day and we parted i took care not to fail in my appointment we were only a party of five or six the conversation turned on the french revolution and the general showed us a key of the bastille i have already said that these keys were the rather foolish playthings which it was then the fancy to distribute three years later the distributors of locksmith's work might have sent the president the bolt of the prison of the monarch who gave liberty to france and to america if washington had seen the victors of the bastille in the gutters of paris he would have less respected his relic the serious essence and strength of the revolution arose not from these bloody orgies at the time of the revocation of the edict of nantes in sixteen eighty five the same populace of the faubourg st antoine demolished the protestant church at charenton with as much zeal as it showed in pillaging and destroying the church of st denis in seventeen ninety three i parted from my host at ten o'clock and never saw him again he went away next day and i continued my travels such was my meeting with the soldier citizen the liberator of a world washington went down to the tomb before even the slightest fame was attached to my steps 
I passed before his eyes as a being utterly unknown. He was at the zenith of his fame, I in all my obscurity. Perhaps my name did not even dwell for a day in his memory. How happy am I, nevertheless, that his eyes have even looked upon me. I have felt their vivifying influence throughout my life. There is a virtue in the glance of a great man. Comparison between Washington and Bonaparte. Bonaparte has but just ceased to exist, and since I have but now spoken of my interview with Washington, a comparison between the founder of the United States and the Emperor of the French naturally presents itself to my mind, the more so, as at the moment I write these lines, Washington himself is gone. Asilla, while singing and fighting in Chile, stopped in the midst of his travels to narrate the death of Dido. I delay, at the very outset of my journeys in Pennsylvania, to compare Washington and Bonaparte. I might indeed have deferred the comparison until I came to speak of my meeting with Napoleon, but should death interrupt me before I reach the year 1814, what I have to say of these two instruments of providence would never be known. I remember the example of Castlenau. He was ambassador in England like myself, and like me wrote part of his life when in London. At the last page of Book Seven of this life, he says to his son, I will treat of this subject in Book Eight, and Book Eight was never written. The circumstance warns me to take advantage of life. Washington does not, like Bonaparte, belong to that race who outstrip the standard of human measurement. Nothing amazing is attached to his person. He is not placed on a vast theatre of action, is not engaged in terrible combat with the most skilful generals and most powerful monarchs of his time, does not haste full speed from Memphis to Vienna, from Cadiz to Moscow. He stands his ground with a handful of citizens in a country adorned with no peculiar celebrity, within the narrow circle of their domestic hearths. He fights no battles which revive the triumphs of Arbela and Pharsalia. He overturns no thrones to build up others with their ruins. He does not say to the kings at his gate, Qui se font pour attendre, et qu'a-t-il-a son nuit? An air of silence envelopes Washington's actions. He acts slowly, as if feeling that the liberty of the future is in his hands, and fearful of compromising it. This hero of a new race manages and directs not his own destinies, but those of his country. He does not allow himself to toy with what is not his own. But from this profound humility, what brilliancy now bursts forth? Traverse the woods where Washington's sword flashed to the light. What will you find? Graves? No, a world. Washington has left the United States as a trophy on his battlefield. Bonaparte has no trait in common with this grave, calm American. He combats noisily on an old theatre of action, in an old country. He thinks only of building up his own fame, takes charge only of his own destiny. He seems to know that his mission will be short, that the torrent which falls from such a height will quickly be exhausted. He hastens to enjoy and to abuse his power, like a quickly fleeting youth. Like Homer's gods, he longs to reach the extremity of the world in four steps. He appears on every shore, hastily inscribes his name on the records of every nation, and throws crowns to his family and his soldiers. He is in haste in everything, in his monuments, his laws, and his victories. Leaning over the world with one hand he overturns kings, with the other crushes the giant revolution. But in overcoming anarchy he stifles liberty, and finally loses his own on his last field of battle. Each is rewarded according to his deeds. Washington raises a nation to independence. A magistrate in the repose of domestic life, he falls asleep beneath his own roof, amidst the regrets of his fellow countrymen and the veneration of nations. Bonaparte robs a nation of its independence. A fallen emperor, he is cast forth into exile, where the terror of nations still looks upon him as insufficiently imprisoned, even under the guard of ocean. He expires, the news published at the gate of the palace before which the conqueror caused so many deaths to be proclaimed, neither arrests nor astonishes the passer-by. What are the citizens to regret? Washington's Republic still exists. Bonaparte's empire has fallen to the ground. Washington and Bonaparte were both nursed in the lap of democracy, both born of liberty. The one was faithful to her, the other betrayed her. Washington was a representative of the wants, ideas, intelligence, and opinions of his time. He seconded, instead of opposing, the movements of the public mind. He willed what it was his duty to will, the thing to which he was called, hence the coherence and perpetuity of his work. This man, not striking because in his just proportions, mingles his existence with that of his country. His fame is the patrimony of civilization. His renown stands like one of those public sanctuaries whence flows a fertilizing, inexhaustible stream. 
bonaparte had it equally in his power to enrich the common domain he had as material in his hands the most intelligent the bravest and most brilliant nation on earth what would not now be his rank in the estimation and reverence of men had he added magnanimity to the heroic qualities he possessed if washington and bonaparte in one he had named liberty the universal legatee of his fame but this giant did not link his destinies with those of his contemporaries his genius belonged to a modern age his ambition to an ancient one he saw not that the miracles of his life outshone the value of a diadem and that this gothic ornament would ill suit his head sometimes he precipitated himself on the future at others fell back on the past and whether going against or with the stream of the age drew with him or repulsed the waves by his mighty strength men were in his eyes but a means to power no sympathy united their happiness and his he had promised to deliver them and he fettered them he isolated himself from them and they became estranged from him the kings of egypt built their funeral pyramids not amidst verdant fields but amidst sterile plains of sand these vast tombs rise like eternity in solitude bonaparte followed their example in erecting the monument of his renown End of chapter nineteen Chapter twenty of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two. Chapter twenty. London from April to September, eighteen twenty two. Revised in December, eighteen forty six journey from philadelphia to new york and boston mackenzie i was impatient to continue my journey it was not to see americans that i had come but to find something entirely different from the men whom i knew and more in accordance with the habitual train of my ideas i was anxious to hurry upon an enterprise for which i had no other qualifications than my courage and imaginative temperament when i formed the project of discovering a northwest passage it was not known whether north america extended to the pole and was connected with greenland or whether it was bounded by some sea approaching hudson's bay and bering straits in seventeen seventy two hearn had discovered the sea at the mouth of the copper mine river in seventy one degrees fifteen minutes north latitude and a hundred and nineteen degrees fifteen minutes longitude west from greenwich on the side of the pacific the efforts of captain cook and of subsequent navigators had still left doubts in seventeen eighty seven a vessel was said to have penetrated to an inland sea in north america according to the account of the captain of this vessel the whole of that which had been always supposed an unbroken line of coast to the north of california was merely a chain of very lofty and rugged islands the admiralty of england sent vancouver to examine into the truth of these reports and he ascertained that they were unfounded vancouver had not yet made his second voyage in the united states they were beginning to talk about the course of mackenzie who left the fort of Chipewyan on Lake Athabasca on the 3rd of June, 1789, and descended to the Polar Sea by the river to which he gave his name. This discovery might have induced me to change my intended course and to go direct northwards, had I not scrupled about making any alterations in the plan arranged between M. de Malzerbe and myself. It was my wish to go westwards in such a way as to arrive at the northwest coast at the head of the Gulf of California. Thence, following the outline of the shore, and always keeping within sight of the sea it was my aim to examine bering straits to double the most northern extremity of the american continent to travel eastwards along the shores of the polar sea and to return to the united states by way of hudson's bay labrador and canada what means had i to accomplish this enormous journey none most of the french travellers have been isolated individuals left entirely to their own resources it is very rarely that either the government or private companies have employed or even assisted them englishmen germans americans spaniards and portuguese have accomplished with the assistance of their governments what unaided individuals of our nation have attempted in vain mackenzie and after him many others have made discoveries in america to the profit of the united states and of great britain which i dreamt of making for the benefit of my native country had i succeeded i should have had the honour of giving french names to those unknown regions and of bestowing upon my country a colony on the pacific ocean of depriving a rival power of the profitable trade in furs and of preventing that power from opening for its own use a shorter way to india by putting france herself into possession of it i have mentioned the projects in my essay historique published in london in seventeen ninety six 
and they were taken from the account of my journeys written in 1791. These dates prove that both in my wishes and my labours I preceded the last explorers of the Arctic seas. I found no encouragement at Philadelphia. I had an idea from that time that the object of this first journey would not be accomplished, and that it would only be the prelude to a second and more protracted one. I wrote to that effect to M. de Malesherbes, and, in expressing my hopes for the future, I promised to poetry that which would be lost to science. In fact, if I did not meet in America with that which I sought, viz. a polar continent, I did meet with a new muse. A stage-coach similar to that in which I had travelled from Baltimore conveyed me from Philadelphia to New York, a city gay, populous, and rich, but which was, nevertheless, far from being what it is now, and still further from what it will be in a few years, for the United States grow faster than my writings. On my way I went to Boston, to see the first field of battle of American liberty. I have seen the field of Lexington. I sought there, as I did subsequently at Sparta, for the tombs of those who fell, obeying the holy laws of their country. Wonderful example of the connection of all human affairs. A financial bill passed in the English House of Commons in 1765 causes the establishment of a new power on the earth in 1782, and the downfall of one of the most ancient kingdoms of Europe in 1789. End of chapter 20chapter twenty one of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two chapter twenty one london from april till september eighteen twenty two north river song by a lady on board the steamer Mr. Swift, departure for the falls of Niagara with a Dutch guide, M. Violet. At New York I took my passage on the packet-boat for Albany, situated some distance up the North River. The passengers were numerous. Towards the evening of the first day, a collation of fruit and milk was served. The ladies sat upon benches on the deck, whilst the gentlemen lay stretched at their feet. The conversation was not long kept up. At sight of the magnificent scenery of the river, we involuntarily became silent. Suddenly some one cried out, See, there is the place where Asgill was taken. A Quakeress from Philadelphia was asked to sing the melody, well known under the name of Asgill. We were among the mountains. The voice of the songstress died away on the waves, or swelled again, as we sailed closer to the bank. The fate of this young soldier, at once a lover, a poet, a man of courage and favourite of Washington, and honoured by the noble-minded mediation of an unfortunate queen, added a new charm to the romantic scenery. M. de Fontaine, a friend whom I have lost, let fall some courageous expressions in memory of Asgill, when Bonaparte was preparing to mount the throne which had been occupied by Marie Antoinette. The American officers appeared to be affected by the song of their Pennsylvanian countrywomen. The various scenes of trouble through which their country had passed rendered the calm of the present more deeply impressive. They contemplated with emotion places which not long since had been filled with troops, and echoed the clang of arms, but were now buried in profound repose. These places, gilded by the last rays of the sun, enlivened by the whistling of the cardinals, the cooing of the wood-pigeons, and the song of the mocking-bird, whose inhabitants, leaning listlessly on their elbows in their enclosures fringed with bignonias, gazed at our vessel as she glided past beneath them. On my arrival at Albany, I went in search of Mr. Swift, to whom I had a letter of recommendation. This Mr. Swift carried on a trade in furs with the Indians, who occupied the territory ceded by England to the United States. For the civilized powers, republican and monarchical, without ceremony, divided and partitioned lands in America, which belonged to neither. After having listened to my statements, Mr. Swift started a number of well-founded objections. He said, in the first place, that I could not alone undertake a journey of this magnitude, without assistance, a guide, and recommendations to the English, American, and Spanish stations, through which I should be obliged to pass. That then, if I were fortunate enough to pass safely through so many deserts, I would arrive at frozen regions where I must necessarily perish from cold and hunger. He advised me to begin by acclimating myself, to make acquaintance with the Sioux, the Iroquois, and the Eskimo languages, and to spend some time among the backwoods men and the agents of the Hudson's Bay Company. When, he said, I had made these experimental trials, 
I might perhaps be able in the course of four or five years, with the aid of the French government, to proceed on my dangerous mission. This advice of which, in reality, I recognised the justice, thwarted my wishes. If I had consulted only my inclination, I would have set out directly on a journey to the Pole, just as one goes from Paris to Pontoise. I, however, concealed my displeasure from Mr. Swift, and begged him to procure me a guide and horses to proceed to the falls of Niagara and to Pittsburgh. From Pittsburgh I purposed to descend the Ohio, and to collect information useful for my future projects. I still kept in view the first plan of my journey. Mr. Swift engaged for my service a Dutchman who was familiar with several of the Indian dialects, and having bought two horses, I left Albany. The whole country which lies between Albany and Niagara is at present cleared, inhabited, and traversed by the New York Canal, but at that time a great part of the country was completely a desert. I had no sooner passed the Mohawk and entered the woods in which the axe had never resounded than I became, as it were, intoxicated with a sense of independence. I passed from tree to tree, and from right to left, saying, Here, no more roads, no more towns, no more monarchies, no more republics, no more presidents, no more kings, no more men. And to try whether I was really re-established in the fullness of my original rights, I betook myself to voluntary actions which enraged my guide, who, in his soul, was convinced I was really mad. Alas, I imagined myself alone in the midst of the forest, where I bore such a lofty head. All of a sudden I knocked my nose against a shed and under this shed presented themselves to my astonished eyes the first savages I had ever seen. They consisted of about a score of persons, men and women, daubed over with paint, like sorcerers, half-naked, with pierced ears, their heads adorned with crow's feathers, and rings in their noses. A little Frenchman, powdered and frizzled, dressed in an apple-green coat, a drugget waistcoat, and a muslin front and ruffles, was busy scraping away on an old pocket fiddle, and playing Madeleine Friquet to the dancing of these Iroquois. M. Violet, for that was his name, was the dancing-master to these savages, who paid for his lessons in beaver-skins and bears' hams. He had been a kitchen-boy in the service of General Rochambeau during the American War. Having stayed behind in New York on the departure of our army, he resolved to devote himself to teaching the fine arts among the Americans. His views had grown with his success, and this new Orpheus carried civilization among the savage hordes of the New World. When speaking to me of the Indians, he always said, ces messieurs sauvages et ces dames sauvages. He bestowed great praise on the agility of his pupils. In truth, I never in my life saw such extraordinary gambols. M. Violet, holding his little fiddle between his chin and his chest, tuned his miserable instrument and shouted to the Iroquois, Places! And the whole party leapt like a band of demons. Was it not an overwhelming thing for a disciple of Rousseau to have his first introduction to savage life? at a ball given by an old kitchen-boy of General Rochambeau to a band of Iroquois. I had a great desire to laugh, but I was cruelly humiliated. End of chapter 21For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768-1800, Part 2, Chapter 22. London, from April till September, 1822. My Savage Apparel. Hunting. The Carcajou and Canadian Fox. Muskrat. Fishing Dogs. Insects. Montcalm and Wolf. I bought a complete suit of apparel from the Indians, two bearskins, one for a short cloak and the second for a bed. In addition to these, a large cap with the earpieces of red cloth, a surtout, girdle, hunting horn, and the sort of cartridge box used by the backwoodsmen. My hair hung loose on my open neck, and my beard was allowed to grow. In this fashion I became a compound of the savage, the hunter, and the missionary. An invitation was given me to join a hunting party the next day, to track a cacajou. This race of animals, as well as the beaver, has become almost extinct in Canada. We set out before day to ascend a river which flowed from the wood where the cacajou had been seen. The party consisted of thirty Indians, backwoods men, and Canadians. A division of the party with the hounds kept along the bank, accompanying the advance of the canoes, and the women carried our provisions. We failed in meeting with the cacajou, but we killed several lynxes and muskrats. The Indians make great lamentation when they happen by mistake to kill any of the latter, the female muskrat being, as is well known, the mother of the human race. 
the chinese who are good observers hold it as certain that the rat changes to a quail and the mole to a laureate our table was abundantly supplied with waterfowl and fish the dogs are trained to dive and when not employed in hunting they are taken to fish they dash into the stream and seize the fish at the very bottom of the river a great fire around which we all gathered served the women for dressing our repast we were obliged to lie down flat with our faces towards the ground to save our eyes from the smoke clouds of which floating above our heads protected us as best it might from the stings of the mosquitoes these carnivorous insects viewed through the microscope are most formidable animals they were perhaps those winged dragons whose skeletons are found again diminished in size in proportion as they are lessened in power the hydras griffins and other monsters of tradition now appear in the form of insects the giants of the antediluvian period are the little men of the present age End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter twenty three london from april till september eighteen twenty two encampment on the shore of the lake of the onondagas arabs a course of botany the indian woman and the cow m violet offered me letters to the onondagas a remnant of one of the six iroquois nations we first reached the lake of this tribe my dutchman selected a suitable place for our camp a river issued from the lake and our implements were arranged in the bend of the river we drove two forked sticks firmly into the ground six feet apart and laid a long pole horizontally on these two supports large pieces of the bark of the birch tree were placed with one end on the ground and the other leaning against the transverse pole in order to form a roof for our palace our saddles served as pillows and our cloaks for bedclothes we tied small bells to our horses necks and let them loose in the wood near our encampment from which they did not stray far fifteen years afterwards when i bivouacked on the sands of the desert of saba a few yards from the jordan and on the banks of the dead sea our horses the fleet sons of arabia appeared to listen to the tales of the sheik and to take an interest in the stories of antar and job's horse it was not more than four in the afternoon when our hut was completed i took up my gun and went out to try my luck in the neighbourhood few birds were seen only a solitary couple sprung before me like the birds which i had followed in my paternal woods by the colour of the male i recognised the white sparrow Nivalis of the ornithologists i heard also the osprey so well characterized by its cry the flight of this noisy bird led me to a narrow valley lying between bare and rocky hills about half way up on one side stood a miserable cabin and a lean cow was wandering about in a meadow below i delight in these sheltered nooks a chico pajarillo chico nidio little bird little nest i sat down on the slope opposite to the hut a few minutes after i heard voices in the valley three men appeared driving five or six fat cattle to pasture and drove away the lean cow with their sticks an indian woman came out of the hut advanced towards the frightened animal and addressed it the cow ran to her stretching out her neck with a slight lowing the planters from a distance threatened the poor woman who returned to her cabin the cow followed her i rose up went down the slope of the hill crossed the valley mounted the parallel ridge and reached the hut i pronounced the salutation which i had been taught seagull i am come instead of returning my salutation by the customary you are come the woman made no reply i then caressed the cow her yellow and mournful countenance assumed an expression of tenderness i was struck with the mysterious relations of misfortune there is pleasure in being affected at the evils which had never been wept over before the woman continued to look at me a little longer with an appearance of some lingering doubt she then came forward and passed her hands over the face of the companion of her misery and solitude encouraged by this mark of confidence i said in english for my stock of indian phraseology was exhausted she is very lean the woman answered in broken english she eats very little they drove her away very cruelly i added and the indian answered we are both accustomed to that is not then this meadow yours she said this meadow belonged to my husband who is dead 
I have no children, and the white men drive their cattle into my field. I had nothing to offer to this creature of God. We parted. The poor woman said a great deal to me which I did not understand. It was no doubt the expression of her good wishes for my happiness, and if they were not heard in heaven, it was undoubtedly not the fault of her who prayed, but the frailties of him for whom the prayer was offered. All minds have not the same aptitude for happiness, as all soils do not bear the same harvest. I returned to my bark palace, where I found a meal of potatoes and maize awaiting me. The evening was magnificent. The lake, as smooth as a looking-glass, lay before me without a ruffle. The river murmured around our peninsula, which was perfumed by the odour of flowers. The whippoorwill repeated his song. We heard him sometimes near and sometimes at a distance, as the bird changed the scene of his loving call. No one called me. End of chapter 23《ハプトゥーマスシャトブリオン1768-1800 Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768-1800 Part 2 by François-René de Chateaubriand, Chapter 24 London, from April till September, 1822 An Iroquois, the Sachem of the Onondagas, Veling and the Franks, Ceremonies of Hospitality, Ancient Greeks. Next day I went to pay a visit to the Sachem of the Onondagas. I reached his village about ten o'clock. I was immediately surrounded by groups of young savages who spoke to me in their native tongue, mixed with English phrases and a few French words. They made a great noise, and exhibited the same joyful appearance which the first Turks did, whom I since saw at Coron, on my landing in Greece. These Indian tribes, surrounded by the clearings of the white men, possess horses, flocks, and herds. Their huts are supplied with domestic utensils, purchased on the one side at Quebec, Montreal, and Detroit, and on the other in the markets of the United States. In passing through the interior of North America, there are found among the different savage tribes the same forms of government as are known among civilized nations. The Iroquois belong to a race which appeared destined to conquer the Indian tribes, had not foreigners interfered to exhaust their resources and to arrest their power. This intrepid man showed no signs of astonishment or fear. When firearms were used against him for the first time, he stood as firm amidst the whistling of balls and the roar of artillery, as if the sounds had been familiar to him all his life, and he paid no more attention to them than to the rolling of a thunderstorm. As soon as he procured a musket, he learned to make better use of it than a European. He never abandoned his club, his scalping knife, and his bow and arrows but to these he added the carbine pistol dagger and axe he appeared never to have arms enough to content his valour thus doubly armed with the murderous weapons of europe and america his head adorned with bunches of feathers his ears cut his arms tattooed and stained with blood this champion of the new world became as formidable to look upon as to fight against on the shores which he defended foot to foot against the attacks of the invaders the Sachem of the Onondagas was, in all strictness of language, an old Iroquois. His person was a record of the traditions of the olden time of the desert. In all the English accounts, the Indian Sachem is called the Old Gentleman. This Old Gentleman, however, was completely naked. He had a feather or fishbone passed through the cartilage of the nose, and on his shaven head, as round as a cheese, he sometimes wore a three-cornered hat in honour of European civilization. Has not very written history with the same fidelity. Chilperic, the leader of the Franks, rubbed his hair with rancid butter, infundens acido comam vitiro, daubed his cheeks with green paint, and wore an extraordinary jacket or plaid made of the skins of wild beasts. He is, however, represented by Veli as a prince, magnificent even to ostentation in his furniture and equipage, voluptuous even to debauchery, and entertaining scarcely any belief in God, whose ministers were the objects of his ridicule. The Sachem of the Onondagas received me well, and made me sit down on a mat. He spoke English and understood French, whilst my guide was acquainted with Iroquois. His conversation was easy. Among other things, the old man told me that although his nation had always been at war with mine, he had always esteemed it. He made complaints of the Americans, whom he regarded as unjust and covetous, expressing his regret that in the partition of the country the lot of his nation had not fallen to the English. The women served up a repast hospitality is the last virtue left to the savages in the midst of european civilization it is known how sacred it was in olden times when the hearth had all the power of the altar 
when a tribe was driven from its native woods or a man came to ask hospitality the stranger began what was called the suppliant's dance a child touched the threshold of the door and said behold a stranger and the chief replied child bring the man into the hut the stranger entering under the protection of the child went and sat down by the ashes on the hearth the women then sung the song of consolation the stranger has found again a mother and a wife the sun shall rise and set for him as before these customs appear to have been borrowed from the greeks themistocles on going to the house of admetus embraces his penates household gods and the young son of his host i may perhaps when at megara have trampled on the hearth of the poor woman under which lay hidden the cinerary urn of phocion and ulysses in the house of alcinous thus entreats arete noble arete daughter of rexenor i throw myself at your feet after having suffered many evils when he had spoken these words the hero retired and went to sit down on the ashes of the hearth i took my leave of the aged sachem who had been present at the taking of quebec the episode of the war in canada afforded some consolation in the shameful annals of the reign of louis the fifteenth it appeared like a page of our ancient history discovered in the tower of london Montcalm, without supplies charged with the duty of defending canada against forces frequently reinforced and four times as numerous as his struggled with success for two years he defeated lord rawdon and general abercrombie at length however fortune forsook him he fell wounded under the walls of quebec and two days after he breathed his last his grenadiers buried him in a trench scooped out by a bomb a grave worthy of the honour of our arms his noble enemy wolfe fell at the same place he paid for the fall of montcalm the penalty of his own life and had the glory of dying on french colours End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part two by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter twenty five london april to september eighteen twenty two journey from the lake of the onondagas to the river genesee bees clearings hospitality bed charmed rattlesnake my guide and i now mounted again and pursued our route which became more difficult and was barely traced by felled trees the trunks of these trees served as bridges over the streams or fascines in the swamps the american population was at that time flowing towards the grants of land near the river genesee these grants varied in price according to the quality of the soil and of the trees and the course and abundance of the water it has been observed that settlers in the woods are often preceded by bees pioneers of the labourer they are the symbol of the industry and civilization which they announce these peaceful conquerors foreign to america and reaching it in the track of columbus sails only took from a new world of flowers treasures of the use of which the natives were ignorant and only made use of these treasures to enrich the soil whence they had drawn them the clearings on either side of the road which i was pursuing presented a curious mixture of a state of nature and a state of civilization in the corner of a wood which had until now resounded only with the cries of the savage and the roar of wild beasts we came upon a piece of cultivated land from the same point of view we saw an indian wigwam and a planter's house some of these houses already completed reminded one in their neat appearance of dutch farmhouses others were only half finished and had as yet no roof but the sky i was received into these dwellings the work of a morning and often found in them a family surrounded by european elegancies mahogany furniture a piano carpets and mirrors at a few paces from the hut of an iroquois in the evening when the labouring part of the household had returned from the woods or fields with the axe or hoe the windows were thrown open my host daughters in their long fair ringlets sang to the piano Paciello's duet pandolfetto or cantabile of cimarezas while the open windows afforded a view of the wilderness without and occasionally the murmur of a cascade mingled itself with the song on the best districts of land villages were established the spire of a new belfry rose from the depths of an ancient forest english manners follow the english wherever they go and after traversing an extent of country where there was no trace of inhabitants i frequently came upon the sign of an inn swinging from some tree hunters planters and indians met at these caravanserais but the first time that i slept at one i vowed should also be the last 
on entering one of them i was amazed to see an immense bed built in a circle round a central post each traveller took his place in this bed with his feet at the post and his head at the outer line of the circle so that the sleepers were arranged symmetrically like the spokes of a wheel or the sticks of a fan after some hesitation i got into this extraordinary machine seeing no one else in it i was just falling asleep when i felt something glide against me it was the leg of my great dutch guide i never in my life experienced such a sensation of disgust i jumped out of the hospitable receptacle heartily cursing the customs of our good old forefathers i went out and lay down in my cloak beneath the clear moonlight to sleep this companion of the traveller's rest was at least agreeable fresh and pure on the bank of the river genesee we found a ferry a number of settlers and indians crossed with us we encamped in meadows bright with butterflies and flowers with our various costumes our different groupings around the fires our horses picketed or feeding near we resembled a caravan it was here that i met with a rattlesnake which allowed itself to be charmed by the sound of a flute the greeks would have made an orpheus of my canadian a lyre of his flute and cerberus or perhaps eurydice of the serpent End of chapter twenty five Chapter twenty six of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part two. By Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter twenty six. London from April till September, eighteen twenty two. Indian family. A night in the forest departure of the family indians of niagara captain gordon jerusalem we continued to approach niagara and were now within eight or nine leagues of it when we came in sight of an indian fire in an oak grove and by the bank of a stream at a place where we had ourselves thought of bivouacking we availed ourselves of their encampment and having attended to our horses and arranged our own dress for the night joined the group crossing our legs after the manner of tailors we ranged ourselves round the piled-up fire in company with the indians and set our bunches of maize to roast the family consisted of two women two children at the breast and three warriors the conversation became general that is to say interspersed with a few words and many gestures on my part and then every one lay down to sleep where he was i was the only wakeful person of the party and went to sit apart from the rest on the root of a tree which ran along the bank of the stream the moon had risen above the trees and a perfume breeze brought with her from the east by the queen of night seemed to go before her into the forest like her fresh breath she gradually rose in the blue sky sometimes gliding on without interruption sometimes passing through masses of clouds resembling mountain summits crowned with snow the fall of a few leaves the sigh of a passing breeze or the whoop of an owl were the only sounds which broke upon the silence and repose around in the distance the ear caught the dull roar of niagara which was prolonged in the calm night air from wild to wild and died away in the solitary depths of the forest it was during such nights as these that a new muse revealed herself to me i caught some of her accents and inscribed them in my book by the light of the stars as an inferior musician would write down the notes dictated to him by some great master of harmony next morning the indian warriors armed themselves with their various weapons and the women collected together the baggage i distributed a little gunpowder and vermilion among my hosts we saluted each other at parting by touching our foreheads and breasts the warriors gave the word to march and went on in front the women followed carrying the children who were suspended wrapped in furs from their mother's shoulders and turned their heads to look back at us i stood watching them till they disappeared in the forest the indians of niagara in the british dominion were entrusted with the keeping of the frontier on the side by which we approached these strange-looking guards armed with bows and arrows refused to let us pass and i was obliged to send my dutchman to the fort of niagara to get a permission to enter the british territory this incident gave me a painful sensation for i remembered that france had formerly ruled over upper as well as lower canada my guide returned with the permission which i still preserve it is signed captain gordon is it not singular that i should have found this same name on the door of my cell at jerusalem thirteen pilgrims had inscribed their names on the inside of the door the first name was charles lombard the date attached to it 1669 the last john gordon and the date of his visit 1804 itinerary end of chapter 26